uh, a little bit about Siemens continuous integration. Hi, I'm Daniel, I work at Google and I've been a committer on the Selenium project for about three years now. Uh, about nine months ago I set up our continuous integration environment that we use at the moment and I'm going to tell you a bit about it. Um, so we've had a problem um, for a long time on the Selenium project that we, we break stuff quite a bit. Um, originally Selenium, oh, so I'm going to refer to Selenium web driver kind of interchangeably, uh, this is kind of the Selenium 2 side of things. Originally, the web driver bit of Selenium was written in a TDD fashion, a very agile fashion. There's tests for every feature. There's all this great stuff. So we have a lot of confidence that if we run all our tests, everything probably works. Which means we have a lot of tests, and we support a lot of platforms. So we have about 650 tests that we run in each browser. We support eight browsers. We support four operating systems. We support 15 versions of browsers. Turns out every time Firefox releases a point release, or these days, if they release every six weeks, they change some stuff. Thanks for the food, guys. If you could stop with the bugs. Um, we have different event models, native and synthesized events. And we commit about 10, 12 times a day. So we, have, we run about 7.5 million tests a day, uh, which means we run about six days of tests every hour, which is a whole lot of tests. Um, these are all really small tests. They're, they're kind of full stack unit tests. So they're unit tests which involve a browser. It's great contradiction terms. Um, they all basically load a static page of content. And say we have a test to check that we can find divs. It loads a page with 10 divs on it. It finds the divs. It says there were 10. We're good. Move on to the next test. Lots of small tests, but a whole lot of them and a lot of different combinations. Um, but as I say, Mozilla break things a lot. Google break things a lot. Microsoft break things very slowly. Um, and so it turns out when we change one line of JavaScript, because we share all our code between all our browsers, we change one line of JavaScript and it breaks Firefox 3, which for some reason we still support, um, which has caused problems when we, when we try and release, because something will break. So about a year ago, our release process was interesting. We'd all kind of gather together by email. One person would be doing the release. It would generally be Simon Stewart. And he'd stand up and he'd kind of send an email out saying, I want to do a release. It's been a while. Jim, does IE work? Aaron, you've had Firefox working with native events on Linux. Does that work? And send out kind of 10 emails to people saying, can you run the tests that you can kind of run and tell me whether they work? And we'd get back all these responses, which would say, yeah, some stuff's kind of broken. And we'd spend a couple of weeks fixing the stuff which is broken. And eventually we'd release, and we'd have some confidence that maybe it would work. It wasn't great. So what did we want? We wanted a simple single page that we could look at with a go, no go for release. Are we good to release, yes or no? Is this page green? Is this page red? Uh, today is a great day to be giving this talk because today we released Selenium 2.22, which I'm sure you're all anxious to go and download as soon as you leave here. Um, and basically, we walked into the office today and looked at the CI server and went, there's about three tests which are failing. We should fix those. We fixed them, and the CI server went green, and we released. It's nice and easy. So we want a simple go, no go for release. And, and that's great, but when stuff goes wrong, because it does, and we know it does because we run a lot of tests, we want to know what's gone wrong, and we want to know how we're going to fix it. So down to one commit, this commit broke this feature. Hopefully without too much noise, hopefully without saying this commit broke this feature, except the feature still works. Um, and we want all the committers to be able to look at this and go, I accidentally broke this, I need to fix it. They need to know they have a responsibility, that they've done something wrong, and they need to improve it. We don't want to annoy them too much. We don't want to send them fake notifications saying you broke this when you haven't. But we want to annoy them enough that they fix stuff. So the way that we kind of, the interface for how, how we do this, the way that users would interact with this, our committers would interact with this, I should say, is we have a Jenkins server. Um, I don't really like Jenkins, but it's open source and easy and free and uh, customizable. Um, so we have a Jenkins server, which is publicly visible. Everyone can see it. It polls the version, so every commit, it kicks off all the tests it needs to run. And we all hang out in an IRC channel, um, which is a really convenient way if you ever need help with Selenium or want to contribute to Selenium. Uh, it's hash Selenium on three nodes. So we have an IRC bot, which notifies us every time a, a test run fails and says, Simon's commit broke these tests. So Simon knows he needs to fix them. Um, so that's kind of the interface we have. and then. We've gone through a series of implementations behind this to actually run the tests. So about a year ago, 
And beyond that, in the past, we had, actually at the time of Bamboo Instance, and we had three virtual machines. We had a Windows machine, we had a Linux machine, and we had a Mac machine. And they'd been configured, and they'd been configured well. We'd seen those tests run, and we'd seen those test parts. We knew that environment was set up properly. So we've done the configuration. It took a long time to do the configuration. I didn't do it. I'm very glad that I think Adam Goucher and, and Patrick Lightbody sat there for days and days and hacked on all the configuration of the operating system you need. Because I'm sure you've all set up Selenium tests and you found that your protected mode settings in IE weren't set up properly, or your X display had a setting set which meant the, key, the clipboard didn't work, or something had gone wrong. So lots of hacking at, at the OS settings. Um, and it, it ran the tests. So every commit, it would run the tests in one version of Firefox and one version of IE. And so we kind of knew that a version of Firefox probably worked and a version of IE probably worked. Except when it didn't work. So occasionally, we kind of see that our build has failed because there wasn't enough disk space to allocate a Firefox profile. That doesn't feel like something that we've probably done in a code change, eaten away all the disk space in this VM. Or well, there was no RAM to start a Firefox. It turns out that sometimes Firefox kind of crashes out gently. By the way, this happens with all the browsers. I'm not picking on Firefox. Um, sometimes when Firefox crashes out, it doesn't crash out very cleanly. And the next time it loads, it loads that window back up. Or sometimes the windows just don't close. And so for a month, we've been leaking like a Firefox process every day. And that adds up in memory. We all know how much RAM browsers take. And so we'd have resource leaks, and suddenly, out of nowhere, we'd have tests failing, or we'd have tests going really slowly. Um, so having these three virtual machines wasn't great. It got the tests running, but it didn't get them running very usefully or reliably, and we were testing one version of each browser. So we didn't have much confidence that, that changes weren't having effects. So when it came to release, we'd open up all the browsers locally and run all the tests. And then we find out that at some point in the last three months, something had broken in Firefox 4. So the next step along the line was to try fresh virtual machines. So rather than having these three sitting there living forever, having the Firefox processes hanging between them, every test run we start up a new virtual machine. It's great. It gives us isolated test runs. You don't have issues with, with Firefoxes hanging around because you don't have that environment anymore. So uh, Yari Bakken put in a lot of work on doing this uh, using Vagrant and Puppet. So Vagrant is a way of, of uh, from a programmer interface, uh, spinning up virtual box virtual machines and Puppet is a way of, in a declarative way, specifying how you want that set up. So it gave us reproducible, consistent startups. So we, they had the same files sitting about each time, they had the same configuration. We spent a long time working out exactly what OS configuration you needed to do to get Firefox to run reliably and we had it there encapsulated well. We had a clean state, uh, clean state for each test run. And it was quite easy to debug. Like, you've got these, these local virtual machines which are starting up on your machine, which you can start up and you can interact with using your keyboard and mouse because it's all in your, your computer. It's really easy to control, but you need to buy hardware. And it turns out if you want to run, I think, 12 different versions of Firefox was, was our high point for what we supported. If you want to run, run tests in 12 versions of Firefox across two different operating systems on every commit, like I said, I think it was sort of six days of tests an hour. You need a lot of hardware to do that, and we're an open source project. We don't have that much money. Um, so there were some problems there, and, and also you have different resource leaks. So you may not have Firefox process hanging around, but if a test run crashes out, you've accidentally segfaulted something, you can have virtual machines hanging about. And if you've just spent a bunch of money on a whole bunch of hardware, to find that half of it's just in use from virtual machines which have been hanging around for a couple of weeks because your tests weren't very clean, that also gets quite annoying. So instead of buying millions of pounds of hardware, we look to Amazon and we look to Rackspace and all these infrastructure as service providers. So um, I'm sure a lot of you have used EC2. It's basically like requesting a virtual machine locally, except you don't own the hardware, which makes it a whole lot easier to scale because rather than saying I need to buy you know, millions of pounds of hardware, I can say, I will give Amazon eight cents an hour for a virtual machine. Works really well. Um, it scales up a lot quicker. Um, it turns out we're all mostly in a couple of time zones. And so there's like a 12, 14, 16 hour period of the day when we don't tend to commit because we're all asleep or doing better things. 
So we don't have to pay to have the, this hardware up at night. Um, but you really have to think about scheduling. So you really have to think about when you bring up virtual machines. So with EC2 as an example, we've tried a bunch of the cloud providers. With EC2, it can take 15 minutes to start up a machine. So maybe you want to pull the machines so you don't start, you know, wait 15 minutes for every test run because that's quite a high overhead. And I think you actually pay for about half of those 15 minutes as well. Um, so if we're launching, we're launching 30 jobs a commit, 300 jobs a day, paying for 300 jobs worth of 15 minute startup time and waiting all that time is really annoying. It slows down the feedback that we get when we commit. Um, particularly on days when we're trying to release and we're frantically committing like 15 changes, 20 changes, 100 changes so we can get a release in, and then having to wait for all of those to go, it's kind of slow and annoying. So you have to think about scheduling. Maybe you want to pull machines so you have like a, a set number by day which are up and you turn them all off at night. Maybe you want to have a machine coming up each time. Um, but you have a lot, it's a lot harder to debug when stuff goes really wrong. So. Amazon have got a great service. EC2 is amazing and wonderful and has, has changed a lot about how the internet works now. But it has problems. Occasionally, a machine will come up and it's not connectable through its network. Occasionally, a machine will just disappear. Occasionally, a machine will take an hour to come up. Occasionally, it claims that you don't have credentials in place to actually bring up a machine in the first place. So you spend time dealing with other people's problems and we have a lot of hacks in our code base now, which are in place basically to deal with if a browser didn't come up after this amount of time, let's do this special case stuff which happens to work well with EC2's timings. Um, so you'll spend a lot of time dealing with other people's problems if you use other people's hardware, other people's software, other people's solutions. It changes where the costs are. Um, resource leaks also can cost a lot of money now. Like we, we, I wrote a bunch of uh, monitoring software basically to go, if a machine has been up for more than a day, because our test run takes at most 45 minutes, if a machine's been up for a day, kill that thing because it's costing us a lot of money. Um, and also, a cost that we didn't really think about, or a, a problem we didn't really think about initially, was that our source code checkout is about 600 meg. And our full build artifacts are about three gigs, I think. Um, and it turns out if you're spinning up a virtual machine and checking out the entire source repository or shipping over a complete build artifact across the internet, that's kind of slow. Like it takes about four minutes for us to ship out an entire build from wherever we're building to EC2 and it takes about three minutes for us to check out the whole subversion repository across the internet. So it's something we had to think about, uh, and again, I have a little bit of code which does peer-to-peer -peer distribution um, between nodes that we've just brought up to, to try and cut that down. This wasn't working very well for us, because there was a lot of hassle. We were dealing with a lot of pains that we really didn't care about, and we still had to configure all these machines, and we were still coming up across problems in, in, our, in our server environment. So, so one thing that we had was, you can copy and paste with, with Selenium. If you press Control-C and Control-V, it will copy and paste whatever's highlighted in, into whatever field. Turns out it's really hard to get a fake X environment to properly adhere to copy and paste. Like a lot of the virtual machine things around will try and integrate with your host machine's copy and paste so that uh, you can copy and paste between your machine and the virtual machine, which can completely hose any chance of being able to fake out Control C, Control V key presses inside the virtual machine. We spent a lot of time trying to deal with that problem. We never fixed it, because we ended up moving to Source Labs. Um, so there's a bunch of browser providers, uh, or, or so, kind of software as a service providers, who, who sit there and say, well, rather than you dealing with all this server, uh, server management or having to buy a bunch of hardware, we've kind of already done this. I think last time I checked, Source Labs had, had launched 17 million browsers. They've seen most of the problems that you see, and it is their business to fix them. Um, and so we tried out Source Labs and we ran some tests through them and they worked with us to get some stuff running nicely. And we're now benefiting from 17 million browsers worth of other people suffering. Um, we, we get all the advantages of, of their, their experience without ourselves having to put in basically any effort. Um, we noticed a few extra things as we were going along. 
So it turns out that Source Labs machines are, I think, somewhere in America. And our tests were running from I think, somewhere else in America. But those aren't in the same data center. They're not next to each other. They're not close. And, and I think on my side, I've put high latency internets are in the middle. And that's not a typo. There are four internets in the middle of our tests. So we have a test runner, which is creating, uh, it's calling webdriver.get. That's an RPC across into Source Labs. Source Labs are then requesting a URL, which isn't in Source Labs, in the browser. The response is going back across the internet. And then the response to the webdriver get command is going back across the internet. You have four internet, internet, excuse me, four internet traversals for every command that you're executing. It turns out that can be quite slow. It adds, it, it, I think, multiplied our latency per test by about 60. Turns out that, that's a bad thing. It's annoying. It slows down your tests. But it can also be a really good thing. So one thing that we found was, uh, so you, you can hover. You can move a mouse over to, say, a drop-down menu, and it will open up the, the options in the menu. Anyone ever tried to do that with Selenium? Has it worked for anyone? About half of those people. Interesting. Um, so we have a test which shows you can do that. It moves the mouse to a drop-down menu. It brings up the menu, and it, it asserts that the menu is open. Running locally, that's, that, that's all good. It moves. It brings up the menu. It asserts the menu is open, and it's done. Running remotely, it moves the mouse. It waits a minute. It checks to see the, the menu is open. And it finds the menu isn't open. It turns out there's a race condition in our code, a quite hideous, horrible one. And our tests worked. As long as all you wanted to do was bring up the menu. But if you wanted to interact with it, well, you were on your own. Um, and so up until now, we'd had complaints about this. And we'd have people going, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And we'd go, no, we've got a test which shows it works. Look, look, I can show you it running. Look, it worked. And suddenly, we, we have a test which shows that it, it's actually not working. Um, so. Realistically, a user doesn't instantly move their mouse to a menu and, and check that it's there. Realistically, a user expects it to hang around. Um, so that high latency, while annoying and slowing down the tests, also helps us actually emulate the user pretty well. Uh, using Source Labs in particular, and I'm sure the others too, um, has given us a lot of bells and whistles too. So I'm sure a lot of people here have hooked up test recording. You know, it's a UI test, so you want to see what's happening, so you record a video. And I'm sure you've written your own infrastructure which does that. And you've written your own thing which, which matches up what test the video is, is for. Or you've suffered through having to grep through the logs every time something fails. Well, Source Labs have done that for you. And they take screenshots of every uh, command you execute. And they'll dump the entire DOM of a page if your test fails. Like, there's a whole bunch of stuff which I spent a lot of time doing. I know other people have spent a lot of time doing. Um, and people shouldn't be doing. People should be sharing the same common implementations. And using a software as a service provider like Source Labs enables you to do that. It means that you can get back to focusing on the stuff you actually care about, about writing the tests, about fixing the code. Basically, you're told the tests ran successfully or not, rather than having to worry about things like an X server. Um, debugging problems can be a little bit tricky. It's even trickier than using kind of Amazon EC2. You have very little control over the machine. Um, like that, That's the trade-off you're making there. You're giving up control in exchange for not having to worry about the things you need control for. Um, but if your browser provider is any good for you, they'll work with you. So uh, Santi at Source um, is, I'm sure, some kind of wizard. And I've been working with him a lot. And every now and then, I'll kind of approach him and say, We've, we're seeing a problem. Some network requests seem to be being dropped. And 20 minutes later, he'll come back to me and say, I fixed your problem. And also three others that you didn't realize you had. Um, so if, if your browser provider is any good, these problems they can deal with. And again, it's something you don't need to worry about. Um, you may not be able to configure your browser exactly as you want. You can't, for instance, install plugins, or you can't I don't know, set certain settings. That's probably a good thing, because your users probably haven't done that either. And if it really matters to you, if it's something which is critical to your app and you're not doing something crazy, like trying to install a rootkit on the machines, I'm sure they'll work with you to fix it. Um, there, there's very different costs in each of these approaches. So you're either buying a bunch of hardware and putting in a bunch of time, or putting in a whole lot of time and a lot of pain, or you're maybe spending a bit more per minute of test 